So, we're going to get kicked into chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we were beginning to wonder if chapter 7 had run everybody off, you know, because we had so few people here. But uh, uh, second and third shift, hopefully, we'll flesh it out pretty good in the room. It'll, it'll be some interesting discussions, I am hoping, as we go into this chapter. Now, as Paul moves into chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, he continues a related but a different angle of discussion regarding salvation and resulting purity. If you remember, this is a major divisional breakup of, of the book that beginning in chapter 5 and really going on for several chapters, Paul is talking about uh, salvation and the resulting purity that comes from it. As we move into chapter 7, Paul is going to cover three areas related to marriage that evidently the Corinthians had written him concerning. So, and this is a, it's a kind of a natural breakdown. Verses 1 through 7 give to us some general <coughs> principles. And then verses 8 through 24, Paul talks about some specific situations. It's a really general statement, but that kind of kind of encapsulates several things that he's going to be looking at. And then the final section is verse 25 through I think it is 40. And there he's talking to the unmarried or virgins. So those are the three basic areas that Paul is going to be talking about in chapter 7. And as we look into this chapter, I'm going to have to, I really want to lay out carefully step by step uh, our approach to the chapter because it's easy to think as you look at these three main divisions and say, oh, okay, so Paul is going to give to us a, a full breakdown and discussion about, you know, what makes a happy marriage, you know, and so forth. No, that's not what he's going to talk about. That really hasn't anything to do with it at all in that sense. Uh, he's really looking at trying to respond to the questions that had been posed to him from the Corinthian congregation within their context. And I think this is, this is important as we read this chapter. It's true for the whole book, but especially as we look into this chapter, that Paul's responses were to the Corinthians' questions and are directed to their situation. Now, and out of that circumstance, we are given some scriptural truths. But we also have to understand the context in which they were written. Chapter 7 is one of those chapters that a people through the years have taken, gone through and taken certain verses. And they have built teaching, preaching, ideas that really backed up their own preconceived notions about marriage and about situations. And by doing this, we have added, when I say we, the church has added to the confusion that the Holy Spirit was seeking to correct through Paul for the marriage situation. Now, as you go through this chapter, each verse is not a universal principle guide in a person's life unless you are situated within that circumstance as the Corinthians. So one of the important things as we look at 1 Corinthians 7, 1 is these three areas within context. So the context is, of course, what they had written him about. We don't have their questions. We just have Paul's responses. The context of that city and where and how they were living. But that really kind of helps us as we move through these three basic areas. Uh, yes. When you look at the context, mm -hmm. when 
We're not marriages like ours, where we pick and choose who we're going to be married to. Weren't a lot of these marriages free or right? They were almost, for lack of a better word, like business deals. I mean, not business deals, but they were yeah. free or Contractual you were like, you were contract. Because that, when you read that, they're still crazy, but it makes it a little more understandable. They had no choice who they were going to marry in most of these situations, yeah. right? Yeah, in many of those situations, especially if they had any money. Right. But then again, if they were of the lower class, they didn't have a voice. So, you know, they were trying to increase their status in society, their place in society. So, you know, it was a very much contractual uh, arrangements. Very little was marriage by what we would term falling in love and wanting to live the rest of our lives with that individual. That really was secondary. You get married and then you see if you like them or not, you know, which is... Uh, for us today, that's a total prescription for disaster, you know. But it was very much a, a, a process that that world looked at in that day. Yeah, very good point with that. Were these people considered, you know, when they had the two classes of people basically in that society, most of these people would have been the lower class? Yeah. That's what, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there, there was no middle class as, as such. As we would think of middle class in America, middle class didn't really exist. There was a you were higher levels of poverty, right. if you will, but you had people that were fabulously rich, and you had people who had virtually nothing. And by and large, most of the Corinthian congregation was of those who had nothing. They would have been slaves. They'd have been servants. They would have been, you know, of the lower class, socioeconomically, uh, in that society. They probably had a few patrons, people who had money, who supported the church, who, you know, maybe the man who was living in incest, that might have been one of the reasons that the church just kind of, you know, just passed over that because this person could have been a supporter uh, of, of the church. But by and large, most of the people there were, were uh, of the lower socioeconomic status of society. So yeah, the context. Really think about the context in which Paul lays out the general principles, specific situations, and then talking to the unmarried and virgins. And there are several key verses that I think helps us as we look at this seventh chapter of um, 1 Corinthians. Verse 6. Paul says within verse 6, that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. New International Version. That's, that's a key verse to that, to that section of scripture. And then you have verse 26 in which Paul says because of the present crisis. And then verse 32 Paul says that I would like you I would like you to be free from concern or care. Understanding those three key points is very helpful in being able to read the context as well as the specifics that Paul gives to these three sections of scripture. 1 Corinthians 7 can be a, a confusing passage of scripture to read. And to, and to try to figure out how does that apply to my life as, as a believer today. But I think looking at these key verses, 6, 26, and verse 32, can really you know, give us a foundation upon which we begin to unravel and understand more clearly what Paul is talking about. So Paul was responding to, to questions that were raised within the situation of believers living in Corinth. That's, that's where they were. That's where Paul was directing his, his thoughts. 1 Corinthians 7 as a passage is very different from Ephesians chapter 5, in which Paul is talking about marriage and how the marriage is like the relationship to Christ and all like this. The context was totally different from what he was addressing in Ephesus to what he was having to address 
in Corinth. And, and in looking at it in that way, we have to understand that chapter 7 doesn't give to us either Paul or the Bible's full picture of marriage issues. You have to bring in other passages of Scripture to get a fuller picture of, the mar of how the Bible views marriage. Remember that these sections, the whole discussion is based upon what they had written Paul about. So Paul is approaching it really from that standpoint. He's not trying to give a full picture of, how, of what marriage is supposed to look, at, look like. He's really looking at it based upon what questions were raised from their living situation there within Corinth. Paul's answering from a theological point of view issues raised by that church within their particular situation. So we, we can't take this chapter out of the context of the Bible's presentation on marriage to promote any certain idea of an individual. Uh, commentators will note that Paul's statements came from questions raised by individuals within that congregation that were confusing people's approach to sexual relationships in marriage. That's primarily where he's going, especially in the uh, first seven verses. Paul is talking about sex in marriage. You think, okay, he's got somebody's got to write Paul to ask about sex. Well, yeah. Because of the context, because of the teaching, because of the philosophy that was trying to weave its way into, and of course Satan behind it all, trying to confuse scriptural understanding about marriage. So, and just as we've done with chapters 5 and chapter 6, we're going to um, walk with intention through these verses. And we're going to try to see what the message this chapter has for people living 2,000 years later than when it was written. And it does hold truths for us now. It is very relevant for us now. It is uncomfortably relevant for us now, especially in our society. Now, I am aware that when someone teaches or preaches or whatever, on marriage, it's automatically walking into a minefield and opening the door to just tons of innuendo and, you know, humorous statements and, and all like this. And sometimes our use of humor in talking about marriage is simply another way of covering up our discomfort in talking about marriage and sex. So, I understand that. In going through some of these passages, writing down some of the things, I actually rewrote some of the typing that I did because I said, oh no, this is, you know, saying it this way is going to open up a door and it'll just go crazy. So I, I understand that, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, because that's just how we look at it. But at the same time, uh, I want us, through the humor and through the awkwardness of talking publicly, about marriage and sex. I mean, this is getting videotaped too, so this is really public. <laughs> to see the richer message of how God looks at us and how we should better look at our relationship with each other as couples in marriage. I'm not going to try to give a full treatment of marriage as we proceed, because that's not what the chapter is dealing with. I'm going to be dealing with what the chapter is dealing with. You know, to get a full fuller picture of that, we'd have to look at a whole lot of other passages and spend a lot of time there. That's not, you know, where we're going necessarily right now. So, uh, that's kind of the introduction to this, but these are, these are the areas. This is what we have to remember. Here are key verses in helping us as we proceed into it. So, let's dive into it. Verses 1 through 7. Paul is giving counsel to the unmarried, or to the married, rather, in this. He reads from the International Version. Now, for the matters you wrote about, see, there's your context coming in. It is good for a man not to marry. 
Some other translations will say it is good for a man not to have sexual relationships with a woman. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. I think that's King James. But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except by mutual consent, and for time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am. But each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. So, obviously there seems to have been a letter sent to Paul or some way that the questions that the Corinthians had were given to Paul. And... The complications of this chapter begin right off the bat in verse 1. Where Paul says, and I don't even need to put it in that. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. I'll use the King James because that's really closer. Uh, the word touch is a more accurate translation of what the Greek has, although the word touch there is a direct inference to sexual touching. He's talking about sex. We might as well get that out in the open and start with it. So, it is good for a man not to marry. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. You'll find all three of these translations of this verse. Now, when you have read this or when you have heard it preached on or so forth, what is he talking about? You've read this chapter all through the years of your life. You've heard about it, taught, preached, no doubt. What is he talking about? What is he trying to say here? It sounds like to me he's going against God's design for mankind. Okay. <coughs> I think it's called procreation. There you go. That's something new that I can't do. What else? What else? This... I think he's talking about in the in the perfect world, like it was perfect before the in the Garden of Eden. It was perfect, and they didn't think about what they thought about before God had to change everything. Pre -sin. Like that. Yeah, pre-sin. That's it. It was. That's kind of what he's talking about. It's what comes to mind. Okay. So. Let's, let's look at that. Any other ideas? Because you think about that too, you think about the Catholic Church and the priests and all the problems they had. That kind of that picture comes to mind. Mm -hmm. think of it. Yeah. Yeah, because in looking at all three of these, um, so Paul is saying, don't follow. God's plan sex means 
you are not devoted to God, and we could say as much as you need to be, and that pre-sin, sex was not carried out. Is that what? Am I, am I catching that correctly? Or did you mean something different? Now, I just mean that's what I think about. That's yeah. the time that he's mm-hmm. doing Yeah. Okay. And all three of the all three of these mm-hmm. lead into these type of understandings, all of a sudden you're going, okay, wait a minute. So if I'm married and I'm having sex, does that mean I'm not devoted to God as I ought to be? Now, we can go really humorous here, and when you get to my age, it doesn't make much difference. But for a young person to say that, to say to them, okay, um, you're not devoted, what, what do you wait? I can't do this in order to do that? I, you know, you see the confusion that comes about. What is Paul talking about here? It is good for a man not to sexually touch a woman. So I think that this this whole idea uh, comes up again and again. What does Paul mean by good? Because you'll see several comparative statements used throughout this chapter related to one's situation and how to act. This passage You'll see this idea of good again come up in verses 8 and 9. You'll see it in verse 26. You'll see it in verse 35. You'll see it in verse 38. And you'll see it in verse 40. So Paul is talking about it is good if. Okay, so in this particular setting, is Paul actually saying, so if you're having sex, it's bad? Even though you're legitimately married, it's something that is less devotion to God. You, know, you see the confusion that comes out with this. So Paul's words, some commentators have said that Paul was simply quoting another slogan that the Corinthians were using. And you know, some have said no, that Paul had probably talked about this when he, was, when he founded the church and was preaching there and so forth. So commentators will vary on where they stand with this. So another question arises that is whether this was a result of Paul's teaching about celibacy, that it got confused. Or was it because of Corinth and because of the philosophies that were still prevalent in that day? A very very strict form of asceticism was also prevalent in that world. Now you had hedonistic life in Corinth that was well established. But at the same time, on the other side, people would be very ascetic and almost hermit-like. And they would have nothing to do with earthly pleasures whatsoever. I don't remember the philosopher's name, but there was one gentleman who said, who preached this minimalism, and he lived in the cave, had on a loincloth, and had a cup. That was all he had. And when he realized that he could drink his water or wine out of his hand, he threw the cup away. So, you know, his philosophy was, you don't have anything of this life. So you still had that kind of thinking going on within that world. And once again, these were sinners coming out of that whole world, being influenced and hearing of all of this that was around them. So this is one of those verses right at the beginning that can lead to all kind of confusing or erroneous teaching. Now, so let's let's look at this. What is he saying? What does he mean by this? I think, indeed, Paul is saying that illicit sexual relations should not occur. The message is in chapter 6, 
are very clear on this. You don't, you know, that's, you don't have to wonder whether Paul is backing up on what he said before. No, chapter 6 is very clear about illicit sexual relations. But Paul then states that due to the prevalence of immorality, due to the situation of life, and to the situation of normal human being urges, couples should have, and that word have, it is good for a man not to marry, but since there is so much immorality, each man should have. That word have is a verb that means to enjoy sexual possession of someone. That's what the word verb means, as husband and wife. So evidently, the Corinthians had written Paul saying, should we as believers even though we're married, should we or should we not have sex as a married couple? And Paul is saying it's, it's good if a man is able to control himself and man as well as woman, we're able to control ourselves, but because he acknowledges the natural proclivity of human beings to interact with each other, and because of the immoral situation of the world, Paul says, every person, every man, woman should have his or her partner, his or her marriage partner, and enjoy the sexual possession of that individual, whether you're a man for a woman, a woman for a man. In other words, the sex act is something that is to be enjoyed by both parties within the marriage state. Now, we're thinking as, you know, as I'm talking about this, we'd say, well, duh. But in that world, this was a radical teaching. In that day, it was well accepted that a man should enjoy having sex. It was well accepted. But it was not so accepted or promoted that the wife should enjoy sex. She's there to procreate the man ought to be able to have a good time while he's doing it, but it's really, it's, it's almost something is deficient in the woman if she enjoys the act of sex, which led to the use of temple prostitutes and prostitutes on the street and mistresses and so forth that did enjoy sex for the act itself. Mere pleasure's sake. So Paul is not saying that you should have sex in marriage. Boy, it's quiet in here. <laughs> I think I might be able to, if there's any mice in the ceiling, I think I can hear. He's not saying that. What he is saying is that it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of all that is and makes up life, every man, every woman should have their sexual partner, which should be their spouse in marriage. That's well, what he said. That's the reason why you get married, and that's the only reason why you would stay married, and don't, you don't even have to live together. You know what I mean? If you read this one section, mm -hmm. it's like, Yeah, and there were some, there were, as we get into uh, Middle Ages and you get into, well, you take in the, in the harems of that day, when the king decided, like in Esther's day, when he decided to take this woman into his harem, he had her there to have sex with her, but then he put her in the building with the rest of the women that he'd had sex with, and he may not see her again for six months to a year, it just depends on how many he had. Like the guy said about Solomon, Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines, Scripture tells us. And the guy was preaching, and he said Solomon had opportunities most men don't have. One, two, three, think about it. I guess you had to be there to hear that. Yeah, Ron's got it. Way to go, Ron. 
Solomon had opportunities most men don't have. He had 300 wives, 700 concubines. He had 1,000 women he could choose from. It, it, it was hilarious to several of us who heard the guy preaching about it. And he didn't think it was too hilarious when we ribbed him about it after. But, uh, but yeah, and there were people who looked at it that way. And you can take this passage and twist it totally out of its context. Evidently, someone had written Paul and, and they were noting, Paul, we're being taught that as, as, as husband and wife, if we really want to get close to the Lord, we should not have sex with each other. What do you think about that? You know, I don't know what the question actually was, but it could have been phrased in some way. Paul's saying, well, listen, it's good for a man not to have sexual relationships with a woman, but because of humanity and because of what God's plan was to begin with, to be, to be fruitful, multiply, that was pre-sin. I don't understand why God instructed Paul to write down it's bad for a man to have that. He did. What did he just say? Yeah. So he's re he, he said it's not good. Yeah. He's going back. What he's saying with this is that out of context, which context would be marriage, it is good for a man not to have sex relations with a woman. It doesn't yeah. exactly say that, but that's the implication. Yeah, that's, that's, that's where he's going with it. He, because he says, but because of humanity and because of sin and because of this, every person ought to have a marriage to be able to satisfy the physical needs of men and women. have to take it in context. You really do, because it's easy. It's very he easy. Out just the first sentence. So that's just like his opening statement. Yeah. And then, because mm -hmm. he's been asked this, these people ask him. So here's his opening statement. But you can't, this is one of those, where you really cannot just take one verse out mm -hmm. of any of no. these chapters and use it. You have to read the whole thing yeah. Yeah. to keep it together. But I'm just curious. When it never changed, though, when you talked about Solomon and one man, it, it never changed and become anywhere in the Bible. Does it ever say that a man can only have one wife? It never does, does it? When you switch from Old Testament to New, I'm just curious, mm -hmm. this might be yeah. a different carol, but I just want you to answer no. this because it's always hung out there. I know the difference between Old Testament and New Testament and everything that changed and came after Jesus, but never in this Bible. Does it ever go back to say it can only, uh, you don't want to say a man mm -hmm. can only have one wife. It never yeah. does that, does it? Now, it does put it in for the requirements for deacons. Paul says right here, a man should have one wife. Yeah, should, should have, have a wife. It, it didn't say multiple wives. Yeah. But does that change it where it was okay like this? I guess one thing is, does God think it's a sin now if a man has two wives? I would say yes. He does because of this. Uh, not necessarily this this verse, but yeah, I still think he would. I think the ideal has always been for a man to leave his father and mother, a woman leaves her father and mother, and they too become one flesh. That has been the that has been the ideal. And that's always been talked about within the singular. It's always been presented. A man <laughs> leaves and has a woman, has his wife. Now there were some leeways allowed. <coughs> when I, I, like David. Well, David, Abraham. In most every case where there were multiple wives, there were always complications and troubles. So the ideal has been one each. And over the years, because of the situation of life, in a fallen world, there was allowances made, but at the same time, and there are, there were passages like Paul, um, no, not Paul, but Moses, in Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteronomy, maybe seventeen, where he talks about the king that they would want one day, and he said you need to tell him not to multiply wives, 
horses or gold. So the, the implication has always been the best is one. The best is one. You know, this, the other thing is what we have to remember is this was a letter. It wasn't divided up in chapter or verse. Oh, no. Okay. No, this it's didn't come for years. It's a continuous letter. And for this, you have to back out to 18 uh, through 20 where he talks about your body, don't you notice your body's the temple of God. So don't give the union in sexual morality because of that fact. So you have to back up and look at that a little bit to understand sure. context. the context of what he's yeah. saying. Within the whole section, yes, indeed. And it's interesting, when, when you mention that, let's look at something here. In chapter 5, verse 1, Paul's having to deal with incest. Chapter 5, verse 9 through 11, he's talking about sexual immorality. In verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 9, he's talking about homosexuality. In chapter 6, verse 15 and 16, prostitution. And now in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, he's talking about sex should be enjoyed within marriage. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, clearly recognizes the power of the physical act of sex. But he's spinning three chapters talking about it here in various formats, various situations. The Bible does not look down upon sex. It does look at the circumstance within which it occurs. It is a vital part of physical life. To deny it is basically to be stupid. You're in denial, you know, as we like to say today. Well, sex don't mean nothing. It doesn't. Oh, well, just look at your television shows. Just look at your movies. Just look at society around you. Yeah, it's a big deal. And the Bible acknowledges, the Holy Spirit acknowledges that, yes, it's a big deal. And it exerts a virtual, unstoppable power over human beings. That's the power of sex. And that's why the Bible talks about sex within proper situations. Because it acknowledges that yes, you're human. Yes, you have physical urges. And yes, those urges are going to be dealt with somehow. It, it, it acknowledges what is real in people's lives. Now, here's something interesting, and I don't know that I've ever really read this. I do personally believe it. But we could ask, why is it then that God made sex so potentially, powerfully wonderful? If it causes so much blasted trouble, why did God make it so powerful to begin with? You know, it's almost like, well, you started it. And it's not specifically stated in Scripture. But from Paul's words in chapter 6, referring to Genesis 2, about the union. And from Paul's words in Ephesians 5, as he talks about the, the symbolism. It may be that the intended purpose of marriage and sex within marriage was to shadow the spiritual reality of our oneness in Christ. Let that sink in just a little bit. Sex in marriage is a type, a shadow of the, the union that we should enjoy in Jesus Christ. To sound really crude here, we should be able to have an, an, uh, an, agor an orgasm experience in Christ in our relationship with him. Now, like I said, I've never seen that phrase given in any commentary that I've ever read. And you may never heard it either, so, you know, 
Jot that down as the first point extra one, two, you know. But because of the power of what the sex act is in a marriage, and how scripture talks about our being the bride of Christ, the unity that we have in Jesus, the wonderfulness of that moment of sexual relationship could very well be a type of the relationship, the depth and the richness and the warmth and the feeling that we can have in Jesus Christ. I think, I think that that has some scriptural backing to it. It's, it's an opinion, so you know what my opinion is worth. But the more you think about it, the more it can make sense. However, for society in general, which includes the church, to think of sex and relationship is too often just simply carnalized and thought of solely in fleshly terms and ideas. And to carry the idea a little bit further, unfortunately, too often, sex between human beings does illustrate the quality of our relationship with Jesus. It's about what he can do to satisfy me in my cravings. How often have we looked at our relationship with Christ as being that? And in that, we miss the depth of spiritual satisfaction and love that God wants to share with us. As Mike preached the other week uh, from the Song of Solomon, which I thought was just a, a, a wonderful message, that whole book talks about physical attraction and it is a type of the spiritual attraction and relationship that we have in God. So uh, I think there's a scriptural foundation for this. What could have been the great richness of sex was marred by the first sin of our parents, Adam and Eve. And it's interesting that Adam and Eve, even though they were brought, they were married. God brought the woman to the man. And she became his wife. Sin caused them to look at themselves in a completely different light. And I've always thought that passage was interesting, that when they, when they looked at each other and saw that they were naked, they were married. Okay? But they were ashamed. Sin has marred our whole perception of who we are and what we can be in God. And I think when God brought Eve to Adam and she became his wife, there was an intention from the beginning that that whole relationship mirror their relationship with God. But sin changed that to where even what should have been, you know, normal, they now were ashamed of their bodies, themselves, this whole humanizing, carnalizing of the marriage relationship, including sex, came up out of that. Questions, comments? Like, I don't know what you were smoking, Billy, but you know. Well, I think you're onto something in that uh, when God brought, in the beginning, God created Adam. Mm -hmm. And Adam was alone. And God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I think that the marriage is uh, not only from a practical standpoint, but also as a form of foreknowledge and a, a, an indication of what Christ would be to the church. The, tri the, the, the Christ will marry the church, mm -hmm. uh, and he'll have relation with yeah. the church 
So I think you're on to something. I, I think that, I think in our spiritual lives, and I don't think I've ever achieved, I think there have been moments when I got close, but I think in our spiritual lives, we have, we have not, we have looked at our relationship with God in such a way that, that we don't realize just how rich and deep it could be and how good it can feel to have a rich relationship. Once again, see the term, relation, relationship. When you talk about relationship between people, you talk about friendship and all that, you talk about a relationship and a marriage, it naturally includes the physical closeness, all of the richness, all of the nearness that comes from becoming one together. We're the bride of Christ. Intimate relationship, yeah. And and sex is a mirror. It's, it's it's a copy. It's a type of the intimacy that God wants with us. And I think in our spiritual lives, we just we have looked at our relationship with God in a different way. Yeah. Somebody's saying, "All right, Billy, that's enough. I've heard all this. I can stand now." Okay. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I, I think that God wants us to be intimate with Him. And it's easy to just simply carnalize that, and you know, but he wants a closeness with us. Now, I, I'm sure that nobody had any idea that we were going to go there based upon this statement at the beginning of chapter 7, verse 1. But that's the, that's, you know, we have to dig into this chapter. We can't take any verse just by itself, at face value, without considering its context, the chapters before, after, and other parts of the Bible. You have to be able to look at it to get the picture of what God wants us to see. And that's where, you know, we're going to walk intentionally, carefully through this. And when we, next week, we're going to talk about the duty that the husband has to the wife and the wife has to the husband in this area of sex. Won't that be fun? So, uh, a little teaser for next week. Maybe that's not the right term to use. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see you then. You're like, see what I think? You can just go so many places.